when he worked the phrase Randy rabbits into his description of the golden ratio, I started to clue in on what a playful and expressive writer he is. And um, let's be honest, that's not something you find in every mathematician or even every scholar that I work with on articles for the conversation. I should have just looked more closely at his profile to get a sense of his many talents though. Manil is a professor of mathematics at the University of Baltimore County, Maryland. He has written three award-winning and best-selling novels. And of course, he's the author of the nonfiction book we'll be digging into today, The Big Bang of Numbers, How to Build the Universe Using Only Math. I'll direct you to his website, which is just his name, manilsuri.com, if you want to know more specifics about all of his claims to fame. But since our time today is not infinite, math concept I got in the book. Let's just jump right in. So thank you for accepting our invitation to join us today, Manel. Oh, it's such a pleasure, Maggie. Thanks for having me. Of course. So first, I do need to issue a disclaimer that I am not a mathematician <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, but I did read every word of the book and it definitely gave me a lot to think about. So Recognizing that some of our attendees today might not have had a chance yet to read the book, Manel, can you give us just a quick synopsis of the project that you set for yourself? Like, what is the Big Bang of Numbers and, and where do you go from there in the book? So uh, I think it started, the story for me started way back when I was an undergraduate in Mumbai. Uh, back then it was Bombay and uh, my algebra professor uh, told us about this uh, very famous saying by Kronecker, the famous mathematician, which said that God gave us the integers and the rest all is the work of man uh, or human beings. And what he meant was that, you know, once you have the whole numbers, one, two, three, four, which are somehow coming from heaven, uh, then you can build up the rest of mathematics from it. And then he went uh, on and said that, hey, I can actually do better. I don't need God. I can actually, as a mathematician, create the numbers out of nothing. And he showed us this uh, marvelous, uh, almost like a magic trick where uh, you start with something called the empty set and then you start building the numbers. And uh, it was it was the closest I've been to a religious experience, I think. Uh, it was really like uh, almost like the walls just dissolved and suddenly there were numbers everywhere. So it was really a sort of primal uh, creative act, if you will. And um, once I started writing in earnest and, you know, I was writing my novels, I was meeting a lot of people who were artists and uh, writers, and they would always say, hey, you know, we used to love math uh, when we were in school, but uh, afterwards, we kind of uh, never had a chance to really pursue it. And can you tell us something about your mathematics? And I was kind of, you know, I was hoping to talk about my novels, but they weren't so interested in that. They wanted to hear about math. So, so I started building uh, a kind of talk, which started with this big bang, as I call it, building the numbers out of nothing. And when I started finally to, I finally decided I should really maybe write a math book and uh, it would be aimed at a wide audience, anyone who's interested in math. And so that, that image stayed with me. And I said, well, can you go further? Okay, you can create the numbers, but can you actually start building everything, including the whole universe from that? So uh, that was a way to get into this project and try to lay out mathematics almost as a story where one thing follows from the other and everything is embedded in one narrative. Yeah, I definitely feel like I'm in the hands of a novelist as you take us through a narrative it, you know, it's certainly not a tech, a math textbook in any sense of it. So who were you imagining to be your readers as you were writing the book? So I think, I think my readers were uh, the people that I've been meeting at artist colonies and uh, just uh, regular friends who, uh, you know, would, would not really, um, maybe would be interested in mathematics, but uh, wouldn't have had the chance to pursue it. And there's just so much joy to be had out of mathematics. So many uh, things that you don't really see in uh, normal courses where um, the emphasis is always on finding the right answer. You know, doing the calculations, finding the right answer. 
And uh, that was another thrust, which uh, kind of got me to writing this book. Um, several years ago, I wrote a piece for the New York Times, uh, which was called uh, How to Fall in Love with Math. And the central idea of that was that math isn't about uh, calculation as much as it is about ideas. So this book is written for people who want to really engage with mathematics on the level of ideas rather than get into you know, real computations and calculations. So it's not going to help you do your arithmetic. It's not going to help you you know, um, balance your bank account or anything like that. Uh, it's really about how math really uh, deals with our lives, how, how we engage with it every day. Yeah, you use numbers as characters in the book, and you even give each of them their own personalities uh, along the way. So obviously there's numbers in there. And after you set off your big bang of numbers, um, you build arithmetic, you go on through geometry, algebra, patterns, physics, infinity. That's the one that really started to blow my mind when I or read your descriptions about all the different infinities that there that there are that you can prove mathematically. Um, but you really dig into some of life's big questions. So what do you what do you see math's role as being in, in grappling with those big thoughts like where the universe came from? I mean, why we even exist? I mean, I was getting very philosophical vibes at different points through your book. Yeah, and that that's uh, that's that's what I was drawn into. Once I started, you know, once you start talking about the Big Bang, uh, what comes into your mind is creation. And uh, there is a doctrine called creatio ex nihilo, which is basically creating everything out of nothing. And you know, that's that's a cornerstone of many religions where God creates uh, the universe out of nothing. Uh, it's also, in some sense, being explored by physicists where uh, you are you you have some sort of singularity and from that uh, you know everything emerges in the big bang so um, my my thought was uh, both these uh, both these uh, areas uh, religion and physics you know they're they're really in the public's uh, imagination much more than mathematics is so is there a way to posit math as the uh, true creation the creative force of everything and this is a question that's uh, been looked at by um, by many people. And uh, there's a famous saying by uh, Eugene Wigner, who was a Nobel laureate. Uh, and I think this was in 1960 or so. And he talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics describing everything in our physical universe. You know, it's so good at modeling physics and uh, what have you. And that you can look at it and say, well, why is math so effective? Could it be that math is really uh, the true driving force of the universe? Rather than us just inventing it and using it to describe the universe, could the universe really be describing mathematics? You know, is it if you twist it around, uh, then mathematics becomes the true force behind the universe. And the universe is just a physical manifestation, an approximation, if you will, of those mathematical ideas. And this is a nice way of looking at things because it gives you a, a completely different view of math. You know, then, then all these, uh, this, this question of unreasonable effectiveness, well, it's very reasonable then, right? It becomes uh, perfectly what you would expect. So, so that's, that's what I played with as well, I think. What you're describing gets at, um, as a non-mathematician, I hear this come up from time to time, the idea of whether math is something that people invented or whether it's something that exists independently of us and that we discover bits of from time to time. Um, and in the book, you, I want to quote this, you talk about the duality between design and accident, intentionality and purposelessness. And I found that idea really interesting that this might be the ultimate metaphor. You say the deepest insight that math can offer us, that it's it's both of those things. Can you get into that a little bit for us? Sure. Um, so the glib answer uh, to, to your question, is it invented or dis discovered? 
is that you have to create a new word uh, instead of discovered, invented, it's it's disvented. How about that? <laughs> uh, but 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 what I mean by that is simply that uh, there are some questions that we really can't get uh, the to any kind of um, logical answer to or or supportable answer to. Uh, one one is the question of our own existence, uh, and you know people might believe one thing or the other, but it always comes down to. Are we here for a purpose or do we just exist? You know, is there some real purpose to our lives, to our creation, to our existence? Or is it just a something that happened randomly, you know, molecules getting together and there's no particular purpose? Math is very similar to that uh, in the sense that uh, we can't really tell whether math is something that's always existed and, um, or is it something that we invent? Now, if we invent it, then we're inventing it for a purpose. If it just generates by itself, starting with emptiness, building the numbers you know, in some strange realm that we don't know about, then it's just wafting. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that just happened by itself. And um, just like math has that duality, that metaphor that can't be resolved, uh, so also, we can't tell about our own existence. So in that sense, math is the metaphor for something that, you know, it's telling us, hey, you, math, you can't decide for math and you'll never be able to decide for yourself either, for your own existence as well. Did you have a favorite concept or part that you worked on in the book, something that either surprised you that you had so much fun working on it or it was just an interesting thought experiment for you? I think uh, the part that I've always been very fascinated with is the one that you just mentioned about infinity, which comes uh, much later in the book. And uh, on a practical level, uh, we can't really tell whether the universe is infinite or not, whether it's a finite universe, whether it's expanding and will keep expanding into infinity. So that question is never resolved. But uh, mathematically, uh, we can certainly talk about infinity. And infinity is something that you know keeps uh, keeps poking its head in our lives without ever showing itself. So it's like an invisible hand that is uh, often pulling the strings. And in fact, uh, at one point, the book was called The Godfather of Numbers, and this was infinity that is really uh, doing everything in it. Uh, so so the, the concept of infinity has always been fascinating. And uh, there was a mathematician, George Cantor, who uh, first looked at this whole idea and tried to set it on a firm footing and really went into the nitty gritty of infinity. And he found that uh, there's actually a whole bunch of infinities and they're not equivalent to each other. So there's a higher infinity, and there's a lower infinity. And um, this was something I've always wanted to talk about and try to uh, make it much more tangible. And uh, the higher and lower infinity, actually you can think of in a very interesting way. Um, the lower infinity is when you count numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you know, you'll know you keep counting them, you'll get to infinity. But now think about a single time interval, let's say a one second time interval. And if you think about that, and you think of time being a bunch of instants that are concatenated to each other, how many instants are there? How many instants do you actually live in that one second? So if you think about it, there you, you know there's an infinite number of instants, almost as many instants as there would be points in a little interval of a straight line. And that infinity, you cannot actually, you can't say this is the first instant, this is the second instant, this is the third instant. You can't do that because there are too many of them. So that already starts giving you an inkling that, hey, maybe there's another type of infinity. And what was really fun in the book was to pose this uh, in the form of almost like a short story. And George Cantor became, uh, you know, this, this mathematician who's trying to save his planet because there are two planets at war and uh, they each have infinite resources and infinite numbers of guns uh, aimed at each other. So, so that I think was the most fun part. Well, maybe this is a moment to, well, first let me remind people that we do have the Q&A section where you can submit some questions. We will take some audience questions um, if we have time towards the end. 
people seem to have discovered that. But maybe we can turn the corner a tiny bit and talk about just your writing process. I would imagine this book is a bit different than writing your novels, but maybe not so much. How how do how do you discriminate between the two kinds of of writing? Well, uh, initially, uh, I didn't discriminate. So this book has a kind of storied history in the in the sense that at first, you know, when I started, I said, okay, I need to do something uh, about math for non-mathematicians. Uh, let me let me do it almost like a public service. I'll do this quick book on uh, explaining math, and uh, you know, it'll take me a few months, and I'll you know just get it out. And of course, uh, of course, it ended up taking more than ten years, but that's another story. But my first attempt at it was um, to um, really go into, you know, it was a nonfiction book. It didn't quite work. Uh, so then I said, I'm a novelist. So why don't I write this as a novel? And that was this godfather of numbers. And the uh, little bits of it have floated into this book. So you talked about the characters, numbers being characters. And that was a whole story with these numbers as characters. Uh, my editor... When I showed it to her, the finished version, she said it was charming, uh, which is not a word you want to hear from your editor because it means that they aren't going to publish it. So uh, <laughs> I'll have to remember that that's yeah. code for yes. not. And, and you can you can tell it to people who send you articles <laughs> too. That's a charming article. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so so it was back to the drawing board at that point, and then uh, it became a nonfiction book, um, and uh, I found that. You know, I think in both types of writing, um, especially since I should just uh, preface this because my first three books were all on India. India is a vast country. A lot of people don't know enough about it. And so I always felt that I was explaining India to people. So that was actually very useful in terms of training to be able to come to this project and say, okay, I'm explaining something that might be even more alien to people than India, and that's mathematics. And so uh, that, in that sense, you know, trying to figure out how people are going to interpret what you put on the page, that's very important. In this case, of course, um, there were other things to worry about, uh, like equations. And uh, I've, I know that that's one of the surest ways of driving people away. So there's a famous saying for uh, people who are working at museums that, uh, if you do a science uh, uh, exhibit, each equation that you put in will lose half your audience. So uh, I was very careful about putting in very few of those. And also, I was able to now, unlike novels, work with illustrations. So there's about 300 illustrations in there, which I think really is uh, almost essential for getting mathematical ideas uh, across. So yeah, so there were different uh, differences. I think the one thing that was the same was I was equally slow. So I'm a very slow writer. Uh, I remember for my second novel, I did a calculation. It took me like seven, eight years to write. And I found out that only 58 words a day uh, made it to the printed version. So I was writing at the rate of 58 words a day. It was actually 58.7, so it was a little better than that. <laughs> uh, but but I suspect that it's even even smaller for this book because it took longer. Well, better than zero words a day, I That's would right. say, yeah. as an encouraging editor. <laughs> um, so what kinds of feedback have you gotten from readers? At the beginning of the book, you you kind of imagine your audience to be anyone from high school students up to hardened math people. And I'm just wondering... Are different um, demographics getting different things out of the book? What are you hearing from people? Yeah, so that's been very interesting. Um, so certainly there have been many surprises where people who, friends of mine who are not mathematicians have, um, you know, really said, okay, they have been interested in mathematics and really put in, uh, like read the book little by little, like maybe a section a day and uh, gotten through the whole thing. Uh, and they have managed to absorb, you know, basically the whole book, which has been very encouraging. Uh, they have, I think most of them have said that, you know, if, if something doesn't quite click right away, you can either give it a little more time or skip ahead and then come back later. 
So that's been one very encouraging set of people. Um, then there are other people who, like my uh, a friend of mine who used to be a German teacher, uh, she went to the library and she said she spent um, like half an hour looking at it and quickly realized this is not something she would ever read. So, so that's, that's fine too. I think it comes down to two things. Uh, one is how interested you are. And this is not just for readers of my book. It's something that carries uh, through society. Like if someone is really interested enough, motivated enough, that's going to be the driving force to be able to get through not only my book, but also a, a mathematics course. And uh, that's something we keep forgetting, I think, in education with kids, especially. You really need to get them motivated. You get, really need to get them interested. You need to have things that are fun. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is uh, just taking it at your own pace and having the stamina to go through these, which of course comes from interest. So um, you know, again, mathematicians have reacted well to this. Um, better, I would say, than some did to the novel version. Remember my editor didn't like the novel version? Well, some people did. I showed it to some mathematicians. This is the old godfather of numbers. And um, some mathematicians were very vehemently against having a novel uh, about mathematics. I remember one um, very fairly famous mathematician who, who said, well, there are two things I don't like about your book. And this is the old version, you know, the Godfather of Numbers. He said, one is the title and the other is the story. <laughs> so, so, okay. <laughs> other than that, everything was fine. Yeah, not a lot left after that, but okay. <laughs> um, picking up on the point you made about uh, math education, do you feel like there are bits of your book that teachers could take into the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, I think I think for that article that uh, I wrote for the conversation, uh, the one you were talking about. Um, or no, it was it was a different article that I wrote, but one of these articles has a uh, problem taken from the book, which has been made into a, a math uh, lesson, and it's about shells. Um, if you look at the patterns on shells, uh, where do they come from? It turns out you can explain them um, in, in quite simple terms using very simple mathematical rules, uh, just in, uh, and, and, and there's a, there's a nice, uh, a lesson that we've developed based on that, uh, where uh, kids can actually fill out little squares and uh, come up with these patterns that look just like an actual shell would. So, so I have been developing some of these things with um, a group in, at Stanford, and uh, we are we are excited about that work. But uh, I think just about everything, like the first part about numbers, uh, how numbers are created. I have actually talked about that in middle schools, and that's gone on, gone, uh, gone uh, pretty well, I would think. Uh, the, these these kids are, you know, it's their first glimpse of what is a number. It's very hard to define what a number is. So looking at it in this way can actually open minds. That uh, that is the kind of stuff you might need to supplement mathematical, you know, standard mathematical lessons. So yes. So not to be too confrontational, but why, why do you care if the rest of us know about math or sort of see what you see in the beauty of math? Why do you want to pull the rest of us into this mathematical world of yours? So I think the standard answer, which I don't quite agree with, is that, um, okay, math is useful, and so it's going to be of use to you. That's that's not exactly uh, true in the sense that I think, um, you know, in terms of how much math you actually end up using in your career, it's only certain people who actually use mathematics. So that's not, that's not a satisfying enough answer. I think what I do think is necessary is that when we have kids, you want them to have as many options as possible. So when people are kids, they need to be interested in math. They need to 
uh, have horizons that are far enough so that if they explore what career they want or what interests them, and if they need something that requires mathematical training, then they will have that foundation. So if at the kids level, if at the primary school level or middle school level, uh, somebody decides they don't like math and then hate it and never take math again, that really limits what they might be able to do later on. So I think I think we all agree that at a young age, we want everyone to at least know what mathematics is and perhaps develop an interest for that. And that's where that's where things get a little tricky because uh, kids are always listening to what's going on in society, what people are saying about mathematics. And when they hear the message, perhaps from their parents or perhaps from society in general, that math is tough or math is useless or math is not fun, then that just gets embedded in them. So uh, in some sense, I'm also aiming this at parents uh, just so that they can bring out that interest and show that they are interested and be interested themselves. Yeah, it drives me nuts when people say, oh, I... I stink at math or I hate math. Like no one would say I stink at reading or I, I hate words. You know, it, it just uh, drives me bananas. Right. Um, I'm wondering one thing that you and I had talked about um, back when we were working on our article was some frustration on your part that it seems sometimes that mathematics is not included in the um, like the popular science media landscape, uh, like lots of the books that get the most attention or um, or articles and things tend to be about, I, I, I don't know, I just imagine like the immortal life of Henrietta Sachs or biographies of people from the past. Um, I'm wondering if we could get into that a little bit. Where, where What is your thinking these days about how math is or isn't included in that popular science realm? And, and does it need more of a place there? Well, I, I suspect there's um, two issues uh, over here. One is that mathematicians are, you know, while we are not always successful at um, making our subject engaging for uh, an expanded audience. So certainly we're very good with people who have an affinity for math, who have grown up, you know, finding these questions interesting, but um, to make it more relatable, um, that becomes tough. And in fact, I uh, start the book with a quote from a former uh, New York Times editor who, who said that, you know, the problem with, uh, with math is uh, it's not relatable. Like physics will tell us, uh, answer questions about our own existence, but math doesn't do that. Um, so uh, that's something that that's a big challenge. How do you make math uh, more, uh, you know, more in tune with the human experience? Uh, and one way is to really talk about how it's uh, embedded in what's around us. But again, that's a very intellectual way. So how do you get to the emotional core that uh, you probably need for uh, really engaging people? Um, and that's, that's, you know, there are people who have managed to do that. And that's certainly what I was trying to do with this story about creation and, and infinity and so on, that things that we all have, have some idea about and would hopefully find engaging. Uh, I think the part that I was carping about, and maybe this is, uh, you know, probably people in chemistry carp about that, about their subject, but um, it's, it's this problem with gatekeeping. So, if there is uh, like a book festival, for instance, uh, the people who organize them, uh, it depends on how open their minds are to mathematics. Um, I was once, uh, uh, I once applied for a residency and um, I, I did manage to get in by the skin of my teeth. This was for writing this book. This was an artist residency where you have to send in something and you know they decide whether they're gonna um, give you this or not. And the organizer then told me that, you know, it was really touch and go because a lot of people were very, and these are all writers, they were very against uh, having a math uh, text, you know, be one of the one of the subjects that they would be um, 
supporting. So, uh, and this is neither here nor there um, in the sense that people are either interested in it or aren't. And certainly the problem that, that we see is that with some other fields like physics or biology, it's much easier to draw people in. And so it's really a challenge for mathematicians to think about how we can draw people in. And if you can draw enough people in, you'll also draw in those gatekeepers for you know, book festivals or whatever and uh, change attitudes, change views. Math doesn't have that same cultural profile. That's, that's the key problem. It, it has a, you know, it, it, it comes up, pops up when some, some, famous, some famous mathematical paradox is proven. And so then there'll be an article in the New York Times and uh, okay, that happens maybe once every 10 years, uh, you know, the famous paradox. But isn't math woven into all the other sciences? It feels right. so integral to everything else. It is. Yeah, it is absolutely integral. But uh, in the popular arena, when you read about these uh, other sciences, it won't be the mathematics that's being described through equations or anything. It'll be the science itself. And if you notice, that's what I've done in my book too. I haven't used mathematical terminology to describe it. So um, it, it becomes a question of, you know, drawing people in and um, talking about various subjects, but somehow bringing out the math. And it's a very subtle thing as, uh, as, as we discovered in that article that I was writing, you can't really start uh, bombarding people with mathematical stuff, but you still want to intrigue them and maybe draw them in and maybe they'll go ahead and learn some more. There's hoping, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so one of the um, the characters, recurring characters in your book, who's not a number, is um, an imaginary version of Pope Francis as kind of a foil as you're going through. And you say that you're going to send him the book. Did your publisher send him the book? Uh, actually, my publisher didn't, but I did. Uh, and <laughs> and well, was it received? Just, well, let me just say how he got in, first of all. Uh, I remember I said that I wrote that article uh, in the New York Times, How to Fall in Love with Math. Well, this article did very well. It rose to the number one spot of most email for the day. And, um, and uh, you know, as the week progressed, they used to have a most email for the week list, and it started rising up that list. And then by that Saturday, uh, it was number three. And then later that day, it became number two. And I was all set to, you know, just receive this accolade of being the most email for the week. And Pope Francis started making these very controversial statements about abortion and homosexuality and so on. And he literally came bounding behind me and jumped over me and got my number one spot. Uh, and that's when I said, okay, I need to, you know, that was almost like a, a message from God or something. So I actually ended up putting, as you said, uh, the Pope as a character in my book. And the Pope is very interesting because he's actually had training as a chemist. He's even worked in a chemistry lab. So he has that background in science as well. And uh, also religion, which is, uh, you know, I'm constantly comparing the math and the religious side. So he's the perfect foil to bring out some of these questions. So anyway, I said that I would, I promised that I would send him a book. And I did send him a book. And uh, a couple of months later, I... I received something uh, in the mail and I have it somewhere here. I should probably pull it out and show you. Uh, but it was it was in the it was an official looking thing which said Vatican. And I was very nervous. I said, my God, this is the Pope's lawyer. They're gonna sue me for having used him in the book. But it was actually um, an assistant of some sort who said that the Pope had received the book and was, uh, you know. Uh, was acknowledging and said something like, you will be in his thoughts and blessings. So I took that as a good sign. I don't think the Pope has read it or anything, but you know, maybe someday he will. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're not being sued, I guess. Is, is I, yeah, exactly. The worst of the possibilities, right? Right. Um, I just want to put a plug in again for the, the Q&A there, if people have questions. Um, 
I see one, maybe this is an easy one to start with. Um, someone asks, do you have a favorite number or a least favorite number, Sino? Mm. Wow. Um, well, I actually don't. It's one of those things, you know, you have to love your numbers equally well. And this is actually, actually, that's very interesting because I remember I was telling you about the godfather of numbers when, uh, when it was a novel. So one of the things in the novel was that this, um, this godfather who's created the numbers, who is infinity actually, um, loves the number zero and the number one. Those are his two favorites, but he can't show it because he has to tell all the numbers that they're equal equally loved and you know it gets a little hard after 10 and 11 and 2000 and 3 million and he confesses that he really can't love them all equally because there's just too many of them uh, so so I, I would say zero and one there I'm going to stick with a godfather's choice <laughs> okay that sounds good one of my colleagues reading the book told me her favorite was I yes see now that's that's an interesting choice so I is the square root of minus one. And um, this is something that, you know, in most, like when you're in school, you probably don't start, uh, don't come across this, but, and, and I debated whether I should or not, but I did ta start talking about it in this book and it plays a very central role. And the idea is that all numbers are created equal, right? So uh, if you can take the square root of four, which is two, uh, why can't you take the square root of minus one? And of course, you know, the standard thing that you learn in school is that such numbers are somehow disallowed. Uh, but mathematicians, you know, if numbers are not strictly for counting, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take the square root of minus one. And that is the number i. And uh, there's a little bit of personality in the book attached to i. i is called ima because uh, it's the imaginary number. Uh, so, and there's a little, uh, you know, I is central to expanding. Like if we only had uh, real numbers, we would just have a line. But if you want to have a plane, then you need these imaginary numbers too. So, so it's woven into the pattern, into the fabric of the book. Here's another one from a, um participant today, there seem to be lots of real constants. Are there any complex constants? Hmm. Well, even, uh, even the number of real constants is, uh, you know, I think again, in this article that was in the conversation, they were, the, I, we were trying to, I was trying to find a constant for each month. And uh, it turns out that it's easy to do for the first three or four months. Uh, like pi day is, you know, 3.14. And then we had um, these other constants that, that worked up to April or so. But then it becomes very hard. So there aren't that many numbers that we actually use, you know, constants that we actually use. Uh, in terms of complex constants, uh, a complex number consists of a real part and an imaginary part. So any constant that you have that's a real constant, then just add zero times i to it, the imaginary part is zero, and you get a complex constant. So that's a little bit of a uh, runaround, but any real number is also a complex number. So in that sense, yes. Okay. Here's another one. How do you reconcile the idea of life, the universe, Etc. coming about accidentally versus the order and logic of a mathematically constructed one? That's a great question. And um, the thing is that with mathematics, you also have to include uh, patterns like randomness. So this is, this is a real reason why uh, numbers like pi are so important. Uh, people have uh, probably heard about irrational numbers. And these are numbers that cannot be expressed as one number over another. They can't be expressed as fractions. And the quintessential uh, irrational number is pi, which is 3.1415. You know, it has a never ending decimal expansion. Uh, if you look at that decimal expansion, you will find that uh, it doesn't have uh, 
It doesn't have any repeating, you know, it doesn't start repeating itself at any point. Now, uh, if you look at pi, uh, people might ask, well, why, why should we be interested in pi? And, and, and the usual answer is, well, it'll give you exactly the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. So if you want the exact ratio, you would have, you know, you would have to find all these infinite uh, decimals in the expansion of pi. Practically speaking, we don't need that. Even NASA just uses pi to about 15 digits or something, and that's enough for all their calculations. So we don't really need it for accuracy. What it really introduces in our world, this world that I'm creating, this universe that I'm creating, is the sense of randomness. Because if you look at the digits in pi, uh, you pick anyone at random, you'll find that you know you can't really. Uh, it, it's a it, it it's not repeating, so in that sense you can't predict it. Of course, uh, this is this is not a really random number. It's something called pseudo randomness, which after all you know pi, and you could calculate it, but. Um, this idea of randomness is very important. And I think that's what is at the crux of mathematics describing uh, something that happens accidentally. Uh, because once you have randomness, you can start simulating a lot of phenomena mathematically, and you will get different um, stages. You will get different end stages, depending upon slight changes in the initial condition. So the whole idea of chaos, of uh, you know, uh, calculations that start with very simple formulas and lead to great complexity, all of these are ways of thinking about these accidents that create the universe. And mathematics can't really describe it all at this stage, but it can give you uh, a kind of glimpse into how that might happen. It can give you a model of some sort. One of our attendees has a follow-up on that. Um, he says, isn't that a paradox? An inexact number like pi gives the definite ratio? Right, yes. And the interesting thing is that uh, um, it's pi, first of all, is uh, something that you can't write down, you can't compute, but uh, you can always um, write it as a you know an infinite series or whatever. But this idea of the definite ratio, uh, that is only true if the world, if the universe that we live in is a flat universe. In the sense that uh, we don't quite know, we suspect that our universe is flat, uh, but it might be that there's a slight curvature to our universe. Probably not, but it's possible. And what that means is that uh, and this is sort of you know what Einstein started looking into in terms of curvature of space-time. Well, space itself might be a little curved, and if space is curved, let's say that um, let's say you look at a sphere. Suppose you look at a sphere, and you draw a circle on it on the surface of a sphere. What will pi be? If you look at the circumference of that circle and measure it, you know, divided by the diameter it'll no longer be 3.14. It'll actually be something that is less than 3.14. Because of the curvature, because of the bulge, if you have a bulging circle, it's no longer true. So when you say that, you know, that's an exact value, that also has some assumptions in it. So I'm just pointing that out as a way of answering that. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question that someone sent in ahead of time about how you balance the different roles that you have as writer, as professor, as whatever else you do in your life. Um, how, how do your different roles inform the work that you do in each realm? Well, first of all, you know, people often ask me, well, how do you do both these things? And I have to say poorly, uh, because as you've, seen, as you've seen, it takes me so long to write a book. Uh, in terms of how they actually interact with each other, I think that uh, when I first started writing, um, I was a new assistant professor and um, I wanted something that would be different from what I was doing at work. In, in, in academia, especially in the sciences, 
you're really asked to just concentrate on one thing and one thing al alone. And if you don't, you might not be taken as seriously. And so I said, okay, I need something other than just mathematics in my life. So I started writing and I used to keep it a big secret because I didn't want people to find out about it in my department. And you know, maybe they wouldn't take me seriously. Maybe I wouldn't get tenure. So I would actually go all the way from Baltimore to Washington DC and go to a writing group there uh, to, to share my work. Um, and so that became more and more serious. And I think that's what you know, finally led to my first novel being published. What that did was it really informed in turn my mathematics as well. So the mathematics informs the writing just because you're trained as a mathematician to be very succinct. And so I think that was something I always try in my writing. But the writing really taught me how even plain prose can be misinterpreted in so many different ways. And so how to uh, fashion and refashion something so that you eliminate these possibilities of misunderstanding. I think that's what was very useful uh, in terms of how I started approaching my work as a mathematician, especially in terms of teaching. Like when you teach, how do you, how do, you do it in a way so that the maximum number of people understand what you're saying. So I think I think that's that's the you know flip side of uh, the interaction between the two. That makes a lot of sense, and also why I, as an editor, liked working with you as a writer because you really had the future readers in mind that you want them to be able to grasp what you're dishing out. You're not just assigning them <laughs> something that you want them to struggle through on their own. You're kind of holding their hand on the on the way. But let me just interrupt you there and just uh, say that uh, w one of the things in math is that there's always a struggle in some sense to really get something, you know, internally. Um, it's almost like each person has to struggle personally. At least that's the way most of us are taught. And so that somehow rubs off. And I feel that that's why. Uh, it's even harder to communicate in in mathematics just because uh, people have in the back of their heads that, you know, especially for higher math people, everyone needs to have their own struggle and only that way will they succeed in uh, making it their own. So uh, I wonder if that's, you know, one of the reasons we see why uh, it's harder to perhaps uh, make mathemat mathematics more, uh, communicate mathematics more easily. Thank you. Oh, here's another question, sort of ripped from the headlines even. Um, okay. The Webb telescope is helping us question assumptions about the age and extent of the universe. Assuming mathematics existed before humanity and we discovered it, how come mathematics has never shown us the true age and size of the universe? Just an easy one there for you, Mano. Easy one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, the thing is that mathematics by itself is completely agnostic. It's uh, it's not going to be something that's going to uh, speak to us in that sense, um, as physics does, in the sense that you can apply mathematics, uh, and you know you can you can apply it to various things, and you can say, hey, this this is a good match. Uh, but as far as things like uh, the age of the universe goes. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that math is going to do. Uh, remember, in mathematics, we always start with assumptions. So in math, you always start with axioms, which uh, then allows you to build everything up. For example, in this book, I started with emptiness, which is the empty set. And then there, you know, that's how I build everything up. Uh, the good thing about that is mathematicians know that you can't keep going backwards. You know, you can't have those Russian dolls that keep fitting into each other and keep asking, well, who created that? Who created that? Who created that? You have to start with some assumptions. So that's 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 actually reassuring in some way. And I think that's what I like so much about uh, the fact that mathematics starts with those and then goes forward. Well, let's switch topics again, not to give you whiplash, but um, one participant is asking, can you briefly tell us a bit about your previous books, the Indian novels? Certainly. Uh, so the first one was uh, called The Death of Vishnu. 
And um, this is about a man who is living in this apartment building on the steps of this apartment building and uh, he's dying. And it was started because I went back to visit my parents in Mumbai in uh, around 1995. And uh, this man, Vishnu, who used to live in our building and do errands was in fact dying on our steps. And he actually died there. And uh, I started writing this as a short story and uh, it started going into a more philosophical realm when uh, a writing teacher said, you know, Vishnu is also the name of the caretaker of the universe in Hindu mythology. So if you name somebody Vishnu, you need to somehow explore that. So that's what opened up this whole new world for me. Uh, it was interesting because I approached it very much like a mathematician in the sense that I saw this building and I saw Vishnu's death. And this building became almost like a theorem for me in the sense that a theorem, when you apply it to different uh, different uh, areas, gives you different truths. You know, it's 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 an abstraction, and so this building was an abstraction. What does this building represent? Well, it's these people who are living in it and fighting with each other, but it's also a microcosm of Indian society. So that was another interpretation. And then Vishnu's dying. You know, I started looking into mythology and. Uh, transmigration of souls and so on. So it became a metaphor for that as well. Uh, so that was the first book. Uh, the second book was The Age of Shiva. And that was more a um, the journey of a woman right after India's independence in 1947. And she's making her way in a very male-dominated world. And uh, she's not perfect, but how she actually, uh, you know, how she actually succeeds in that world. And it was a story of her and her son, basically. And then the third one, I decided, okay, I need to put in some uh, science slash math characters in it. So that actually has both a physicist and a statistician in it. Uh, so those are the two main characters. And that's called the City of Devi. And that's again in Mumbai, and that's in the future. So um, there's the threat of a nuclear war with Pakistan, and you know there, there's there's a love triangle unfolding uh, uh, in front of that. So uh, the third book, especially, was was very interesting because I got completely stuck at it uh, at one point, and uh, I just could not go any further. And um, you know, I was making these trees. I was approaching it like a mathematician. I was trying to advance the plot, so I was making all these possibility trees. And each way that I went, I always got stuck, or it was something, some kind of plot contrivance, which you know didn't really work. So I finally did this enough, and I declared that I had mathematically shown that this book could not be written. You know, I just thought, okay, I've proven it. Uh, luckily, my agent, who was not a mathematician, didn't appreciate my proof, and uh, she said, "You better get back to it and you know finish this book." Which is finally, I managed to finish it. So those were the three books. And it's kind of uh, interesting. I thought that I was done with this uh, philosophy, this mythical kind of, you know, um, where do we come from kind of philosophy that I had in the three books. But uh, apparently not, because now this one looks at it from a mathematical point of view. Well, I think that is a great place for us to rest for now. Um, we are planning, the conversation is planning to post the video and the transcript of our discussion for the book club online. We'll email everyone who RSVP'd once we have that up. We can continue to the discussion in the comments section there. Um, so if we weren't able to get to your question, whether you emailed it in ahead of time or typed it into the Q&A, I encourage you to hold on for another day or so, and we'll try to uh, get that up and running so we can continue there with Manil. But Thank you so much for being our inaugural guest, Manil. Uh, this was a, an excellent discussion and a really great book to kick everything off. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thanks. And I just want to kick in. I'm Beth Daly, the executive editor and general manager of the conversation. If you didn't see me before, I also want to thank uh, you, the, the people attending the webinar, for making this possible. Uh, we're supported by uh, readers and donors for our nonprofit effort at the conversation and it made today possible. So thank you so much.